By the end of the 18th century, the glorious Spanish Empire was already experiencing a slow but steady decline. In Britain, the Industrial Revolution was well on its way. France, inspired by the ideals of the Enlightenment of the previous centuries, toppled its Anshan regime through the French Revolution. France later ventured in the Napoleonic Wars, expanding the French territory all throughout Europe in the tail end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. The commitment of Britain to rapid industrialization and trade, guided by the ideas of progress, liberalism, and improvement, gave them ubiquitous presence in the fledgling world market that extended to the Far East. These developments in Europe inevitably affected Spain's position in the Western world order, and by extension, affected the Philippines, albeit being its farthest colony. But how did the economic, political, and social developments in Spain in the long 19th century contribute to the creation of the Filipino middle class and the intelligentsia where Jose Rizal belonged? Let's talk about this in this episode of Rizal On Air. This is Beck Alporja. This is Ligan Belaria. This is Aaron Maliari. And this is Janet Rigindin Estelia. And you are listening to Podcasts, Conversations on Philippine History, Politics, and Society. Okay, so welcome back to Rizal On Air. In our pilot episode last week, pinag-usapan natin yung RA1425 or yung Rizal Law or yung dahilan kung bakit kayo nag-aaral ng Rizal sa high school at sa college. So kung nahihirapan kayo sa inyong Rizal course, sisihin natin si Recto at si Laurel. Anyway, ngayon naman, let us talk about the historical context of Rizal. Meaning, ano ba yung lagay ng Pilipinas at ng mundo nung panahon na pinanganak si Rizal kasama na din yung mga magulang niya at yung mga tao na pangunahing naka-impluensya sa kanya. Actually, meron na tayong episode where we already talked about the 19th century. So it's on our second season, episode 4. Pwede yung balikan yan. Pero for this episode, we will focus on specific aspects of the developments in the 19th century that directly affected Jose Rizal. So ano tong mga to? First, let's talk about how economic developments benefited the inquilinos kung saan kasama ang pamilya Mercado. Tapos syempre, let's talk about the developments in education. And finally, pag-usapan natin yung revolutionary ferment ng mga panahon na to. Which of course makes perfect sense given that the century ended with the Philippine Revolution against Spain and the subsequent Filipino-American War. So ano ba talaga ang meron sa century na to? So in our introduction, we have mentioned two great revolutions. First, uh, the French Revolution that started in 1789. So the importance of the French Revolution in world history is something that couldn't be overstated. Ito yung concrete manifestation kumbaga ng enlightenment ideals no you know that you know actually came with it. Di ba nga yung trope ng French Revolution was liberté, égalité, fraternité. So it started a tidal wave of liberal ideals in Europe and beyond. And the second great revolution was of course the industrial revolution. And you know this might come off as something that was heavily economic Pero sa totoo lang, yung implications nito were actually social and political as well. Yeah, kaya nga sinabi din ng ilang historians, diba, na yan yung age of revolutions, diba? No? So, dito umalagwa yung, yung maraming mga events na nagbago sa 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 dynamics ng, ng politika ng mundo. No? So, dito rin natin nakita yung uh, pagbabago at paglago ng production because of technological and scientific advancements. Industries boomed in the West, dumami ang mga factories, railways, and people were producing goods, and people were also moving from place to place at a pace that was never seen before. So, most of these things were happening in the West, of course, in Europe, uh, particularly in Britain, France, and Germany. Nasaan yung Spain? 
At this point, Spain, who was a mercantilist superpower of a bygone era, found itself lagging behind its counterparts in Western Europe. Ito yung problema, no? So Spain's former glory was heavily dependent on the rich silver mines of its colonies in South America. So, syempre, nauubos yung minang yan. And when the mines started to dry up, Spain started to decline. I think ang isang mahalang indicator niyan ay yung pagtatapos ng galleon trade, which was a mercantilist trade. Di ba nakatoon lang yan sa China, Acapulco, at sa Espanya? Meron din kayong earlier episode on the galleon trade, di ba? Ang alam ko season 2 yun eh. O, o di ba? Alam ko lahat ng episodes nyo. And then, ano, binilikan ko to kanina. <laughs> anyway, ang tanong, anong kinalaman ng Pilipinas dyan? And more importantly, anong kinalaman ni Rizal? So, sabi ni Lee na tapos ang kalakalang galyon at kinailangan ng Pilipinas ng bagong commercial purpose. We serve as an intrapot of the ships coming from China and Acapulco. Parang yun talaga yung purpose natin sa colonial economy ng Spain. But the Mexican Revolution happened in 1810 and the galleon trade ended almost immediately after. So, wala na tayong commercial purpose kaya kailangan ng bago. Dito na nagsimula yung realization ng vision ni Governor General Jose Basco E. Vargas where the Philippines would use its underutilized land resource and venture in cash crop agriculture to supply the raw materials in the industries in the West. So for the first time, the Philippines started to engage in cash crop or commercial agriculture and to actually engage in the world economy. Kung dati, nagasaka lang ang mga Pilipino for subsistence and domestic consumption, ngayon, foreign investors like British, Dutch, and even American trading companies invested capital for the large-scale production of products like tobacco, hemp, and sugar. Lalo ng sugar, ano. So, kumpaga, parang... Virtually, nawala ng kontrol yung Espanya sa ekonomiya ng Pilipinas. Kasi ang mga pangunahing namumuhunan sa bansa ay ibang mga foreigners. In this setup, medyo naging war yung Spain. Kasi parang, aba, teka, baka mag-take over ng kontrol itong mga ibang bansang ito. Ano. So, naglagay sila ngayon ng mga restrictions dyan by the 1830s. And therefore, itong mga foreign investors na to, they needed the help of those who are already in the colony. So, sino itong mga to? The Chinese... Uh, the mestizo, and the natives in, you know, to help them in various trading functions like acquisition of lands, mobilization of labor, transportation of crops, at yung overall ret- retail trade. So the Chinese immigrants served as middlemen between the provinces, kung saan itinatanim, yung mga crops, where the crops were cultivated and harvested, and the merchant houses in Manila. Meanwhile, The mestizos and some rich natives looked over the production of cash crops through subleasing the large estates o yung mga hacienda um, that they actually leased from the friars at sinasablet nila sa Indio farmers naman. So ito yung nagpayaman talaga sa inclino class kung saan nabibilang yung pamilya ni Rizal. So, their family was said to be among the more, if not the most, affluent family in Calamba. Kasi malaki yung estate that they were leasing. May kaya talaga yung pamilya Mercado at kahit yung sa mother side niya actually, sinasabi na uh, mayaman din na mga taga binyan. In other words, talagang nakinabang ang pamilya Rizal sa paglago ng ekonomiya noong 19th century. Uh, consequently, they were able to afford sending their children to school. Uh, so the girls attended La Concordia, for example. Pasiano was sent to Manila to study at the Colegio de San Jose where he was acquainted with the secular priest and scholar Jose Burgos. So Pasiano, who was born 10 years before Rizal, was the actually we can call first activist in the family in some ways. No? So he was exposed to the secular and liberal ideas of his contemporaries who were also from the affluent families na ipinadala sa Maynila para mag-aral. Pero anong meron? Bakit dumami yung mga anak mayaman, quote-unquote, o mga siguro konyo na pinag-aaral sa Maynila ng mga panahon na yun? Well, tulad nga nung binanggit kanina, the spoils of the growing economy transcended race and ethnicity. In fact, parang naichapuera pa nga yung mga peninsulares. Nagsiyaman yung mga kriole, mga Chinese mestizo, and even the old principalias. So they were yearning for new social capital. 
Marami na silang pera. So, ano ba bang pwedeng social capital yung makuha nila? Yun yung edukasyon. So, kumbaga, status symbol na rin yung education. That's why these families did not only send their children to Manila, dapat higher level. So, some even sent their sons to study in Europe. So, malaking flex yun. I think kahit naman sa kasalukuyan, no, for a Filipino to study in Europe or to study abroad, malaking bagay siya, malaking flex siya, malaking social capital siya. Pero to be fair, there were also reforms in education at this time. Kasi nga, the economy was modernizing and urban population was growing. So, there was an increasing need for skilled labor as well. Kailangan ng teachers, clerks, bookkeepers, and other professionals. Siyempre, di naman pwede na ganyan ang demand sa ekonomiya. Tapos, ang ituturo sa school, puro dasal-dasal pa rin, di ba? Tama. Pero speaking of reforms, to be fair naman kay Mother Spain, yes, apologies, <laughs> meron din namang mga ano, <laughs> meron din namang mga education reforms that emanated from the peninsula at this time, right? Like yung educational decree of 1863 na yung aim niya talaga to reform the colonial education system in the Philippines. So the decree included the establishment of two elementary schools in each municipality, isa para sa mga lalaki tapos isa para sa mga babae. They also provided a standard curriculum and decreed for the establishment of normal schools or mga schools for teachers. So, under this decree, ayun nga, di nalang puro dasal yung tinuturo. Pero meron pa din kasi under pa din naman ng mga pari yung mga schools. Pero ang point nga ay, there were pockets of reforms here and there. Di ba nga, in 1868, meron pang order to change the name UST or Universidad de Santo Tomas to Universidad de Filipinas o PAC. Kung nagkataon na, no, di ba, meron tayong UFI. <laughs> UFI. 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 <laughs> di ko alam. Pero syempre, bonggang-bonggang no ang sagot ng mga sangkaparian. Pero napwersa pa din naman ang UST to reform. Uh, that by na 1870s, nagkaroon na sila ng mga courses on medicine, surgery, pharmacy, and other science courses. I remember also this Uh, very interesting case when the Ateneo started handing out deg- degrees. The Dominicans of UST actually dinemanda nila yung mga Jesuits kasi bakit daw nagbibigay ng degree? Kasi dapat UST lang kasi UST yung Royal and Pontifical University in the Philippines. So nakarating pa yun ng Spain pero nanalo yung mga Jesuits. So kung nanalo yung UST nun, walang Ateneo ngayon. Cheres! No? So, uh, anyway, <laughs> so ganito halos Gan- ganito yung halos... Buti na lang. <laughs> ganito halos yung dynamics nung lipunan noong 19th century sa Pilipinas. It was really wrought with tension between the conservative and the emergent liberal uh, forces. At pinaka makikita yan sa politika mismo sa Espanya. At this time, kung saan mabilis na nagpapalit yung regime uh, from absolute monarchist to liberal... Uh, and then minsan nagbabalik, no? yung mga ganyan. So, ang epekto niyan sa Pilipinas, papalit-palit din yung colonial government kasi every time magbabago yung regime sa Spain, magde-deploy sila syempre ng bagong governor general. Tapos, yung bagong governor general, may bagong gabinete, may bagong policies. At OA ito ha, imagine from 1800 to 1860, nagkaroon tayo ng 24 governor generals. So, parang every two years nagpapalit. So, yung mga policies, even reforms na pinapasok ng mga liberal sa limbawa, halimbawa itong education reform, hindi naman talaga yung nai-implement fully. O kung nai-implement man, sobrang tagal, like decades yung bibilangin. Pero I think ang point din ito ay talagang forced to be reckoned with ang mga liberals sa Espanya ng mga panahon na to. Liberals were a loud bunch who were gaining real momentum in Spain. And syempre, dinakapagtaka na marami sa mga Pilipino na nag-aral nga sa Espanya ay profoundly na influensyahan ng kilusang ito. Kasi ba diba, relate sila eh. Kumbaga, the liberal cause of equality, of human rights, of human dignity really resonated with them. Especially because of what they have experienced at home. Even Rizal had his own anecdotes of being discriminated against because he was an Indio. Oo, pero itong realization na ito ay hindi lang limitado para sa mga kabataang Pilipino na nakatapak sa Europa. I mean, di ba, si Pasyano nga, namulat din kahit di naman siya nag-aral sa ibang bansa. I think yung talagang danas na pumunta sa Maynila, makipagtagpo sa mga kapwa nila Pilipino, magdiskurso tungkol sa mga bagay-bagay sa kalagayan ng lipunan. Tapos, may lagay pa in direct confrontation with their Spanish counterparts at 
harap-harapang mabastos at madiscriminate. Kumbaga, sinong hindi mararadicalize doon? At isa pa na nag-contribute doon sa kumbaga matatawag natin na disillusionment ng ating middle class at educated class or intelligentsia ay yung progress na nakita nila sa Europe, di ba? Di ba nga si Rizal, nung nag-travel siya sa Germany at Britain, nainggit siya, tapos na-realize niya na ang bulok-bulok ng Espanya kumpara sa ibang mga bansang ito. Tapos dito din nila nakita sa Europa yung halaga ng kalayaan sa pamamahayag, sa pagpuna at yung pag-demand ng pagkakapantay-pantay. Which at this time were virtually absent in the Philippines. And of course, they were also affirmed by their European allies. Maraming mga European liberals ang sumuporta sa kanila and even encouraged them to form groups like the Indios Bravos. No? So, they were entering a new age, and they knew it. And this was the context of Rizal's birth and existence. Of course, malaking tanong yung what really makes a man, di ba? Sarili niya ba? O yung panahon at konteksto kung saan siya umiral? So, what do you think? Mas mapag-uusapan natin yan sa mga susunod na episode ng Rizal On Air. That's it for episode this week. Let us know what you think and connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We also upload our episodes on YouTube, Podcast TV. Subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Anchor. You may also visit our website at podcast.org. Muli, maraming salamat sa pagkinig. See you and have a good day.